Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to interrupt your, your conversations uh, <laughs> to open a new, a different conversation. Um, and uh, to welcome you all here um, to the last uh, event this semester of the uh, Interdisciplinary uh, Intersections Group, Medieval and Renaissance Cultures and Studies. I'm Charles Burroughs from the Departments of Art History and Art and Classics. And I would like once again to thank the Dean of Arts and Sciences for support of this initiative through the President's Initiative Fund. The group includes medievalists and early modernists from many disciplines and many institutions. And if you are new to the group uh, and would like to be on the mailing list, please let us know. I also want to, before getting to the main event, I want to recognize the other ringleader of our series, an embarrassed David Rothenberg. Those of us from the case community, at least those of us who read the slightly annoying campus newspaper know, David recently received the Albert, the Alfred Einstein Award uh, from, the American <laughs> from the American Musicological Society for his, quote, springtime symbol, his analysis of springtime symbolism in medieval Renaissance music. And Einstein among us, I'd like to congratulate David. Um, it's easy to introduce our present speaker because his webpage is so entertaining and informative at the same time. I'm just going to kind of crib from it. David Wallace comes to us from the University of Pennsylvania, where he's the Judith Rodin Professor of English. In fact, he's the very first to hold this chair endowed in honor of a famously effective former president of the university and a very strong woman. I'll come back to David's connections with strong women in a moment. David is a wonderfully adventurous scholar a medievalist, uh, this is really his words, who looks forward to the early modern period. He works on English and Italian matters, with books both on Chaucer and Boccaccio, and one of the intersections between them. And many here may know him as editor of the Cambridge History of Medieval, uh, Medieval English Literature, uh, latest edition 2002, and co-editor of the Cambridge Companion to Medieval Women's Writing. <coughs> he has additional interests in French, Germany, Eastern Europe, women's writing, romance, the prehistory that discovered the Americas, and the history of slavery before and after the Columbian encounter. So I don't think we hear much about romance this evening. Um, he has somehow contrived to publish on cleanness in relationship to novelist theology. Among his many publications, I would single out his important recent book, Pre-Modern Places, Calais to Suriname, Chaucer to Afro-Ben, Oxford, Blackwell, 2004. In his own words, this book, quote, reclaims the effective power of places, known and unknown, essaying forms of long historicism that range freely through centuries. The book speaks to the currently muddled state of English culture at Calais Gate, neither fully part of greater European affairs nor fully able to shake, or shake the residual trappings of 400 years of global imperium. It ponders the possibilities of historicist work in the face of post-colonial critique. It traces processes whereby black stroke white uh, was constructed as a defining uh, difference of the pre-modern world. Close quote. Interdisciplinarity, that is working between the disciplines, is inherently a spatial metaphor. As you can see, David's alert and self-conscious writing explores and interrogates boundaries between, between and within disciplines, between national traditions, between history and theory, questioning both contemporary and medieval ideologies and presumptions. He operates easily between different worlds. It's uh, suitable that we have a camera pointed at us tonight. Having made, for example, a mark as a TV pundit with a series in progress on Mallory for the BBC and recent contributions to Terry Jones's I Hate the Renaissance program and to a feature on the histories of stupidity and laziness. <laughs> and oh yes, you want to know about strong women. He will speak about one today, but he recently returned from Oxford where he gave the Clarendon lectures in English on, quote, strong women, life, text, and territory, 1347 to 1645. His title today is Borderline Sanctity, Dorothea Monta, Gintergras, and Pope Benedict the Sixty. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to thank Charles and David Rothenberg for uh, extending this invitation to me as part of the Disciplinary Intersections Initiative. Um, this paper certainly is a spaghetti junction of diverse disciplinary approaches. Um, I'd like to thank the Northeast Ohio Medieval Renaissance Studies Group. Uh, MedREN is the way we've been doing things at Penn for quite some time, so I feel really at home in this format. Um, 
My last visit to Case Western was made 20 odd years ago when I came to meet up with medievalist Debbie Ellis in the English department. And I well remember the beautiful medieval objects in the Cleveland Museum of Art, which alas I can't see today, um, especially that extraordinary French table fountain that seemed to come straight from the set of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, I've not seen anything like that anywhere since. So today's talk unfolds in eight sections which are listed on the handout uh, so you can keep track. And the first section is locating Dorothea of Montau. Dorothea Schwarza was born as the seventh of nine children at Montau in present-day Poland in 1347. From an early age, Dorothea cultivated extremes of ascetic practice and religious self-discipline. At 16, she was married off to a swordsmith called Adalbert from Danzig, 40 miles upriver. While producing nine children, Dorothea continued to haunt churches and dark corners and practiced extremes of self-mortification. In her 38th year, with all but one of her nine children dead, she went on pilgrimage with husband and daughter to Aachen. In 1389, Dorothea journeyed alone to Rome. By the time she returned, her elderly husband was dead. In 1391, she moved 60 miles south of Danzig to Marienwerder, which is now Polish cuisine, subjecting herself to the spiritual direction of Johannes von Marienwerder. On the 2nd of May 1393, Dorothea walled herself into a cell in Marienwerder Cathedral, thus becoming Prussia's first anchoress, Dorothea von Preussen. Having survived an exceptionally cold winter, she died on the 25th of June 1394 just 13 months after enclosure. By 1406, 260 people from all over Prussia had attested to her sanctity, and there were 342 sworn and notarized accounts of miracles and cures. The process of building her case for canonization was masterminded and controlled by her father confessor, Johannes of Marienwerder. Having composed a series of Latin works, in 1405 he released a German text known as Das Leben der Zellige Frau Dorothee Kreuzerin in der Turmkirche zu Marienwerder des Landes zu Preußen. Bishops sent copies to their parish priests, churchgoers throughout Prussia, who tell of the extraordinary virtues of Dorothea the martyr, worthy of honour. Now, Clarissa Atkinson has argued that Dorothea of Montau was the continental holy woman closest to Marjorie Kemp in time, place and spirit. Hope Emily Allen believed that the influence on Marjorie may well have been direct. Parallels between the lives of Dorothea and Marjorie are indeed striking. Neither was blessed with the aristocratic pedigree that could win credibility for a female religious. Both revered Bridget of Sweden, both travelled on pilgrimage to Aachen and Rome. Both inhabited and travelled through spaces of Hanseatic trade. Each was burdened with a husband who fathered many children. Each of these husbands proved slow to die. Each woman worried about her sanctity as non-virgin. Each wept prodigiously and so accelerated souls through purgatory. Each reported elaborate visions involving visits from Jesus, chiefly as an extremely handsome and well-dressed young man. Each was given to short enigmatic utterances. Each was at times thought insane or feared going mad. It's unlikely to be true, as Gunter Grass reports, that, quote, Prince Henry of Derby bought a gold-plated crossbow from Dorothea's husband, the Danzig swordmaker, that he failed to pay for. It is, however, certain that in the summer of 1392, when Marjorie Kemp was about 19, ships fitted out at Lynn carried Henry Bolingbroke to Danzig. Having sojourned with the Teutonic Knights, Henry and company intended to fight the pagans east of Prussia. In 1433, Marjorie sailed to Danzig herself with her German-speaking daughter-in-law and stayed five or six weeks. Inspired by Atkinson and Allen, then, we approached the reading of Das Leben der Seliger Frau Dorothee with considerable anticipation. Perhaps it might prove to be a prototypically German book of Marjorie Kemp. Failing that, perhaps, the anchoress Dorothy might, might prov provide Teutonic cousinage to her fellow recluse and exact contemporary, Julian of Norwich. Such expectations are soon defeated. It's the difference between Dorothea Montau and Marjorie, Lin, Marjorie of Lynn that proves arresting, hence mutually clarifying. And to grasp this, we must commit to actually reading Dorothea's Leben, a process upon which much criticism has been loath to report or dwell, and you'll soon see why. So the second section is called Young Body as Ploughed Field. 
The poem of Das Leben brings us quickly to a direct question, number one on your handout. Who has ever heard or read of human beings deliberately inflicting upon themselves such a variety of very bitter and lengthy sufferings as she inflicted upon herself? Part of the strategy of this text is to forge imaginative associations between the sufferings of young Dorothea and the sufferings of the holy martyrs who willingly and joyfully confronted cruel martyrdom. The stumbling block here, however, is that Dorothea's cruelties are self-inflicted. John of Marienwerder does point out that Dorothea's body is assaulted both by her own hand and by our Lord, who tormented her often. But his most characteristic recourse here, as elsewhere in Das Leben, is to berate the wavering or resistant reader, which is to say, you and me. Therefore, you beastly person, or you who discredits the works of God which are incomprehensible to you, be silent and hold your tongue. A little later, a little later Dorothea Doubters are likened to mad dogs devouring themselves with mindless barking. Book one proper opens with a rousing exhortation, number three. Lift up your eyes, incline your ears, all inhabitants of Prussia and all believers in Christ. See and hear how the ancient, the eternal God has renewed his grace in the land of Prussia in his special maiden named Dorothea. The life of Dorothea Marienwerda tells us cannot be told briefly, number four, because of the severe uncommon spiritual exercises, castigations, sufferings and unheard of torments she inflicted on herself from her seventh year until the end of her life. The age of seven was thought to mark the end of bodily innocence. After that date, a young person might experience sensations and temptations of a fleshly and sexual nature. Dorothea is seen limbering up for this lifelong agon, even before reaching the age of seven. Under her mother's direction, she performs serial prostrations. Alone at night, she subjects herself to sleep deprivation, stands with her arms in the shape of a crucifix, or hangs from nails like a cross on the wall. Having reached seven, however, Dorothea suffers an unforeseen bodily assault that marks, as the chapter heading has it, the beginning of her sufferings. This is number five. When the blessed Dorothea was seven years old, carelessness caused her to be scalded all over her body with boiling water to such a degree that her mother, greatly tormented by compassion, had to nurse the child in a cradle. In the midst of this trauma which binds mother and daughter through diverse experiences of pain and mental suffering, Christ appears to offer comfort. Das Leben Book 1 then immediately leaps forward to a holy conversation said to have taken place several weeks after the Feast of St Agnes, 1394. Christ here invites Dorothea to accept her status as Christ's chattel while contemplating, quote, the pain of great wounds that you have lived since childhood. This is number six. Consider, Christ says, how I kept your wounds open, brimful of bitter pain, whose scabs sometimes itched as though they were working alive with gnawing worms. At other times they delivered such sharp jabs as if they were shot cram full by sharp arrows. Sometimes they burned as if ignited by fire. At times they swelled until they broke open, as still other times they bled freshly and profusely with excruciating pain as though they were indeed fresh and new. During such times, your eyes were so full of bitterness that even when you were asleep, they seemed filled with smoke and soot. Because ever since childhood, you endured so many and such serious wounds, you would have become lame, crooked and ravaged by the foulness of your wounds had I not miraculously sustained you. Four or fair prefix verbs in German, as in that last German sentence, these prefixes frequently speak to processes of loss, decline and reversal. Their accumulation in that last German sentence suggests poetics of willing submission to physical pain. The injunction that the adult Dorothea should think her way back to childhood and the great wound she suffered has already been plentifully fulfilled by the text. Chapter 5 of Book 1 told of wounds aggravated by the wearing of a knotty hair shirt, of log pillows and sleepless nights, of crawling on hands and knees, of imaginary bondage coupled with hurling face first to the ground. Chapter 6 tells of the tortures of both fasting and forced eating, of remaining hungry at the dinner table or of eating yesterday's leftovers. Chapter 12 sees the newly wedded Dorothea jabbing her feet with needles to induce festering that might excuse her from dancing. Forced to the dance floor, she wears shoes and stockings to cover up her self-wounding. Vigorous movement fills her shoes with blood, 
straw line clogs, chafe her scabs and set her bleeding again. Chapter 15 cycles us back to childhood as we cross once again the crucial Lehmen or borderline of the seventh birthday, signalling the onset of sexual self-awareness. Dorothea is a heroine or conqueror, Heldin. The conquered territory is her own body. This is number seven. What a conqueror she became over her body through God's love anyone may hear and marvel about, for she flagellated her body often with rods, whips, thistles, thorny branches and with hard, knotty, barbed scourges. Also, as she reached the age of seven, she often burned herself with boiling water and from time to time with red-hot iron and burning candles. At times she injured and wounded various parts of her body with boiling hot oil. With such devices she inflicted one wound beside the other from her shoulders down to the hems of her sleeves and from the hips upward as far as her clothes covered the body. And she treated her breasts in the same way until all these individual wounds looked like one big single wound and her body resembled a ploughed field. Marian Verda continues his account in ever more alarming detail, emphasising again that such practices began in the seventh year of her life. It's not too much more of this kind of thing, I should say, but there's more. Um, she acknowledges finally that his account is difficult to listen to, schwer zu hören ist. The next chapter begins by addressing itself directly to the reader. Gedenke leser dieses Kapitels. We are soon summarily requested simply to accept the omnipotence of God. We then hear how Dorothea keeps her wounds open and fresh by pricking and poking at them with stinging nettles, broom twigs, nutshells and any other hard instruments laying to hand. Such wounds are sometimes submerged in brine. In winter, she sits under dripping taps until frozen to the ground. All this, Marion Verda summarises, is to be celebrated, but of all this he anticipates, or but all this he anticipates may again spark readerly resistance. Number eight. Be silent, you smug, beastly, carnal, sensuous, weak, lost, wretched creature, and do not contradict or condemn the miraculous deeds of God. Although there's much to balk at in Marion Verda's text, the rebellious resistance he anticipates in his medieval Prussian readers may differ from what troubles us. We are appalled, we are appalled at violence applied to a tender young body. They may doubt that a female could withstand so much, that such a manly heart was encased in womanly flesh, which the German actually says. This last phrase finds an echo in Petrarch Senile's 17.3, where the young heroine is said to possess a manly soul of mature years in her virgin heart. Marianne Verda's Leben is, of course, a clerk's tale, one in which the narrator assumes absolute Walter-like control of the writing process and of its female protagonist. Dorothea, who was unlettered, has scant life outside the text and has little voice within it. Marianne Verda has her enclosed within the cathedral of which he is canon. She's forbidden to speak to anyone without permission. John of Marion Verda determines the shape of Dorothea's Leben by employing the extractive processes and privileges of the Father Confessor, and he writes and disseminates the texts. He writes first, moreover, in Latin. His German life returns to, rather than originates in, the vernacular. Hope thus diminishes of catching particular inflections of Dorothea's tongue. Dorothea is said to love him, on first seeing him at Marienwerder, like no other. Her long speeches flourish only once she comes under his control. Towards him she must be totally obedient. She must similarly obey her two battering spouses, Adalbert and Christ. She owns nothing. Once dead, the Lord will decide whether she is to be buried naked or clothed. Once she has died, Marianne Verda controls all reference to and memory of her, an extraordinary feat since hundreds of people are called to testify in the canonization process. And the unquestioning obedience demanded of Dorothea when alive is now expected of the reader. Harsh lashings into line anticipate any wobbling of readerly credulity. For Johannes von Marienwerder, then, in Japad or text, readings beyond his terms of reference are figured as disobedient, lily-livered, and perhaps heretical. And section three is peasant colonists and Teutonic Christendom. Diane Elliott, now at Northwestern, speaks of Dorothea 
being born at Montau into the well-to-do artisan class and of her becoming an exemplar of the contemporary lay penitential movement. Marion Verde himself presents Dorothea as the first and foremost brilliant local exemplar of faith values comprehended throughout Christian Europe. And he begins his account of her life by locating her birth. This is number nine. Dorothea was born to honourable, God-fearing parents in a village called Montau in the Episcopal See of Pomerania in Prussia. Marion Verde offers nothing to explain how Dorothea's father made a living in this part of Prussia. He's simply described as a man of Erban Lebens, honourable life. Wilhelm Schwarzer was in fact a newcomer to Montau at the time of Dorothea's birth. Like so many other peasants from German, Dutch and Flemish territories, he was expert in draining and working swampy terrain. Montau, located in the delta of the Vistula and Nogat rivers, which you can see in the map in that little V, Montau was a new settlement much needing such expertise. It attracted peasant colonists to the far borders of Teutonic Christendom by offering them the prospects of Erban Leben's honourable life, a life less tied to labour obligations exacted upon serfs. Wilhelm Schwarzer was one of the first to arrive and he proved very successful. With Dorothea's mother, Agatha, a woman of fierce piety, he fulfilled the primary obligation of the successful colonist, namely the production of a large extended working family, seven children and some 50 grandchildren. Dorothea obediently played her part here, although eight of her nine children died young. Germanic peoples have been moving east since the time of Charlemagne. From the 12th century on, the rural economies of central and northeastern Europe were undergoing radical transformation. Economic Germanization in these rural areas was relatively straightforward, since climate, topography and soil differed little from what was already known. Germanic language and culture flowed in with such settlements, ousting local languages and traditions. Prussian, which becomes almost synonymous with German, in fact refers to a Baltic language related to Lithuanian and Latvian. By the 17th century, it had become extinct. The peak of German settlement in Prussia was reached in the first half of the 14th century. Wilhelm Schwarzer thus arrives towards the very end of this process. His new family cultivated an area that could not, given its marshy character, extend much further. It thus established itself as an economic frontier. Dorothea's father was recruited and transported from the Netherlands by Ludolf Koenig, High Master of the Teutonic Knights. The Teutonic Order did more than just complement economic expansion into Prussia by adding military might and religious rationalisation. They were themselves deeply invested in pioneering land development and commercial exchange. They thus financed costly processes of moving peasant populations eastward and of sustaining them until the first crops could be harvested. They supplied them with vital infrastructures for colonisation, such as mills, dredging equipment, housing and places of worship. This drive to the east first accompanied and then substantially replaced an earlier Drang nach Osten by the same Teutonic order in Palestine. The Virgin Mary is the least localizable of all saints. She travels well, bringing mighty accretions of iconography and tradition to sacralize and federate new territories. Members of the Teutonic order were popularly known as Marienritter, Mary's knights. They generated and consumed a very considerable amount of Marian literature. I'll give you a sample on the handout. The most important locale structuring Dorothea's physical movement and visionary life, Marian Borg, Marian Verda, and Danzig's Marian Kierka, are all dedicated to Mary. Tylo von Kulm's characterization of the Virgin as a green and fertile plain, and then as a palace, resonates with the landscapes and landmarks of her Prussian life. The Teutonic Order had emerged during the Third Crusade of 1189-91. The Knights first defended the Latin colonies of the region from their castle, 30 miles from Acre. They maintained a second front against the Muslims from a stronghold in Armenia, and they took an increasing interest in campaigns against the non-Muslim infidels, or Saracens, in Prussia and Lithuania. The term Saracens is used of them. So when Acre fell in 1291, the Teutonic Order lost its Palestinian base. Crusading and colonizing energies could thus be more exclusively concentrated at the Prussian frontier. 
Control of the Vistula, the mighty waterway connecting Central Europe to the Baltic at Danzig, proved vital to the conquest of Prussia. In 1308, when invited to put down a revolt in Danzig, the order restored order and elected to stay. A fortress was built and Teutonic law was applied. The following year, the Grand Master of the Order transferred his seat from Venice to Marienburg. This mighty fortress monastery lies very close to Montau, and there was a satellite establishment in her village. So when young Dorothea marries her aging Albert Gladiator at Montau, and then heads north to Danzig, she already moves within the orbit of Teutonic Knights. When she heads south to her final earthly destination, Marienwerder, she feels their influence even more keenly, because Father Johannes of Marienwerder, her confessor and author, was also a Teutonic knight. John of Marienwerder was born in 1343 and educated at the hometown cathedral he returned to some 40 years later. In between, he pursued a promising 20-year career at Prague. Further advancement, however, fell foul of disputes between Germans and Bohemians. Hope for a university position came to naught. He thus returned to Marienwerder in 1386 with few prospects. In 1387, he joined the Teutonic Order and was appointed Domherr at Marienwerder. This scant recompense for a theologian and teacher of proven abilities um, was galling. But his fortunes changed on the eve of Corpus Christi 1391, when a widow arrived begging him to hear her confession. From the very moment of her arrival in Marienwerder, and in the narrative progress of Johannes' German Leben, read to the knights at mealtimes, we see Dorothea's steady absorption into the Gesamt Kunstwerk of the Teutonic Order. And John of Marienwerder is only one of many uh, men whose clerical, flagging clerical careers are, are revived by taking on a figure like uh, Dorothea. The next section is from Hovel to Palace, Griseldian translation. The most consistent feature of Dorothea's Leben is her extreme and unquestioning obedience to masculine authority. This begins with obedience to parents. It continues with the husband who regularly beats her for wifely shortcomings. This is presented as part of her spiritual formation. It is fitting, Das Leben says, that she receive hard knocks while serving the husband's needs, for well-observed obedience is more pleasing to God than sacrifices. Thus, when Albrecht punches her on the mouth for failing to prepare, her, prepare his fish supper, she smiles at him with her fat lip. When she forgets to buy straw, he beats her chest so hard that blood mingles with her saliva. She bears these blows joyfully. When a daughter cries on the road back from Aachen, her husband beats her fiercely around the head. Although the wounds take years to heal, Dorothea accepts this cheerfully. The most humiliating moment for Dorothea as a medieval wife comes when her husband finally took the keys from her and left her nothing at all to her authority. He himself went to market to purchase what they needed. In medieval narrative, control of the keys is the most powerful signifier of domestic rule. For Marjorie Kemp, recovery of the keys represents definitive return from postpartum depression. For Dorothea's Leben, surrender of die Schlüssel marks one more step towards the loss of all such personal authority as she enters the anchor hold. Christ, who has figured throughout as her severe and violently inclined second spouse, makes it clear that Dorothea is entering a new, more restrictive form of domestic bondage. Number 11. You shall live chastely in your cell, busy day and night to please no one but me. You shall live as a wife who has a strict, harsh husband, because of whom she never dares to leave the house. This sounds unpromising. By the end of her short life in the anchor hold, however, Dorothea is to behold a palace of unimaginable splendour where she will marry her magnificent knightly master. Such heady translation reminds us once again of Griselda, for Dorothea is a peasant girl marrying way above her station. Unmarried Dorothea, we are told, glistens like a lily as a chaste and modest virgin. Suitors flock to her since she is sober, moderate, humble, outgoing, gracious, pleasant and peaceable. She's also skilled in bringing disputes to positive conclusions. Before translating his Dorothea from Anchoritic Cell to Palace Wedding, John of Marienwerder emphasizes that she consider herself a speck of dirt, the lowest of the low. 
She considers her, herself wicked. She is humiliated by Christ for failing to achieve absolute humility. She strives for vernichtung, self-obliteration. And the Lord tells her that she must be more submissive than ever before and must give yourself entirely to the authority of your spiritual directors. It's under this strong authority within the enclosed space of the anchoritic cell that Marian Verde performs the, act, the crucial translatio of Dorothea in her Leben. From first to last she remains under the spatial aegis of the Teutonic order. Her soul is a mighty Borg like Marian Borg, built to withstand ferocious engines of war, number 12. Excellently fortified was the fortress of Dorothea's soul, with its deep motive humility, its solid walls of strength of character, with its surrounding wall of caution, the high towers of angelic protection, with the many assault engines and defence mechanisms of various virtues. If Marian Verde is the ground zero of Dorothea's anchoritic enclosure, Marian Burg, the great castle fortress, palace and monastery of the Teutonic Order, is a visionary point of arrival. And it has been reconstructed after World War II. It's quite a spectacular palace that dominates the flat landscape. Dressed by female attendants as if she were a great king's daughter, Dorothy appears out across the endless flat plain of a native landscape. Finally, she espies her bridegroom approaching from afar, number 13. The most honourable, the most noble, and the most praiseworthy ever to appear on earth. He arrived with a huge, mighty host. The army was excellently equipped and made up of handsome, well-born men, especially selected to accompany the bridegroom. Prussian audiences, which included members of the Teutonic Order, could readily visualise Teutonic knights sweeping across the horizon, bearing Dorothea to their castle. Further anticipated delights in the wine cellar of my sweet love and in my secret chamber might easily be associated with the famed opulence of Marienburg, which was well provisioned and centrally heated. The, the Teutonic Knights lived very well. They had fancy wallpaper and pet monkeys. Such a translatio, we are told, always took place at the time Dorothea received the holy gracious sacrament of the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, Dorothea's vertical Eucharistic integration with God is imaginatively associated with lateral transfer from Marian Verda, the anchor hold, to Marian Borg, the Teutonic stronghold. Between them, these two locales map a spiritual Heimat, a Vaterland, as the text has it, to which every German reading traveller should ultimately return. Dorothea was Prussia's first anchoress, and her Leben was to be Prussia's first printed book. It was printed, appropriately enough, at Marienburg in 1492. Next section is Restlessness and Martyrdom, Territory and Work. Pilgrims flocked to Marienwerde following Dorothea's death in 1394. Traffic on her death anniversaries was heavy. Her anchor hold is very unlike those we infer from Ancrin Wissa and Julian's revelations. Such English spaces seem permeable to the world, open to initiative and particular vision from within, of a network of houses, or of a hazelnut in the palm of your hand. The regimen to which Dorothea is subjected by Marienwerde at Marienwerde is altogether more severe, claustrophobic and closed to the world. And yet this airless Prussian space seems almost crowded by exterior forces, that which proves intractable on the plane of history, struggles to find expression, if not resolution, through the suffering body of Dorothea. The later Middle Ages, Carolyn Walker Bynum has argued, shifts from stasis-like imagining of the afterlife to a more dynamic pursuit of desire. In Marian Verda's Leben, extreme restlessness powers all the protagonists, human and divine, to a truly extraordinary degree. Dorothea is the acknowledged driving force that sets her family travelling across war-ravaged German territory in search of superior religious life. They hide out among cows and sheep in churchyards. They are robbed and the husband is beaten. The daughter is threatened with abduction and rape. Such restless movement is shared throughout the text by the visionary Lord she pursues. In the book's penultimate chapter, he's seen yet again with his powerful host rushing towards her at great speed. Such extreme physical energy, consistently expressed in spatial terms, can hardly be contained by the strict bounds of the cloister. Dorothea's ravening hunger for the Eucharist finally exceeds the cloister's limits. In receiving the sacrament for the very last time, she actually pokes her head out of the window to get to it faster. Insatiable desire to pursue spiritual grace across physical territory proves particularly poignant at this first and only anchor hold 
on the Prussian frontier. Dorothea's travels before enclaustration always led her westward. Travelling east was an option for Teutonic knights, but not for a wife from Montau. In dying, however, Dorothea disposes herself into the last of her bodily signs, number 14. At this point, it's worthwhile to know, John of Morienwerda says, that as she was dying, the spotless, humble Dorothea positioned herself on her cot differently from the way she ever had before by placing her head towards sunset and her feet towards sunrise, the way the dead are placed in their graves. Such alignment by souls soon to bequeath the corpse to the world might be taken as a last act of tidy-minded housekeeping. The setting of feet to the east, however, might also signify solidarity with Teutonic knights in their long eastward march against Lithuanian pagans. At the very end of Book 2, in a chapter entitled How She Was and Still Is a Great Martyr, Dorothy is reassured by the Lord that you are a great martyr, tormented through and through with spiritual exercises, self-castigations, disciplines and torments. And when she dies, Marian Verda will bury her as a martyr and shall esteem and, and honour you as such. In the course of her life, Dorothea shed as much blood as any virgin saint in the Golden Legend. The bid to have Dorothea acclaimed as the first saint and the first anchoress of the Prussian frontier badly needs the credentialising support of martyrdom. Ultimately, almost six centuries later, Dorothea will be canonised. But her bloody body never perfectly aligns with this process. It's worth pondering what other meanings or what other conflicts it might assume. Dorothea of Montau is born into a twofold struggle directed by the Teutonic Order for territorial conquest against Lithuanian pagans and against the land itself. Christian Europe regarded the first of these struggles with increasing scepticism. Polish and Lithuanian crowns had united in 1385. Lithuanian Grand Duke Jogliega was baptised Catholic, married 12-year-old Jadwiga, and hence became King of Poland. This did not stem the eastward crusades. The Teutonic Order, like other colonial powers in later centuries, continued campaigning against the religial, residual paganism supposedly at its borders. It didn't matter that the Lithuanians were Christian, they still kept going on crusade. Cultivation and settling of this border territory thus assumes strong strategic importance. Land is at once wrested from paganism and is in the marshy delta region of Montau, reclaimed from nature. Wilhelm Schwarzer was drawn from the Netherlands across Europe by the Teutonic Knights to support such a venture. His daughter Dorothea is eventually drafted into associated processes of spiritual and military conquest. Processes of subduing and improving upon nature continue to breed anxiety and suspicion in and of Roman Catholic cultures. Thus in England, quite recently, Labour Minister Ruth Kelly, who's been associated with Opus Dei, is suspected of ambivalence on issues such as stem cell research and birth control. Such anxieties have deep historical roots. In Inferno 15, where Dante meets his old teacher Brunetto Latini, fire rains from the skies, the earth is barren, and nature runs backwards. This is the circle of the Sodomites, a place delimited by a series of walls that are compared with those built in Flanders to reclaim land otherwise lost to the sea. The marshy desolation of Flemish landscapes, wrested so precariously from or against nature, was also imagined to resist the claims of noble blood. For Bavaria Herald in 1390, the wasteland of Flanders could only be redeemed by the healing touch of knightly rule. There's much more in this vein. We might also dwell upon the Flemish setting of Chaucer's Pardoner's Tale. Read within this context, the endlessly tortured, near-martyred body of Dorothea Schwarzer looks less out of place. The connection with Netherlandish landscape claimed from or against nature is suggested both by her father's profession and by a telling detail of her life. Her body, endlessly cut and castigated, suggests a field ploughed up by a peasant, als ein Acher mit ein Flug durchfahren. Ambivalences projected onto bodies at one extreme territorial frontier in Flanders, where the sea is driven back, as Dante says, here play out on another territory border. Dorothea's physical action is truly ambivalent in that she is both the plower and the ploughed. 
Later in the text following enclosure at Marion Verde, Dorothy is said to run or fly over the land, her tears of compassion watering the world gather like rain in the furrows. The ways in which anxieties over land use, natural limits, economic viability, spiritual fidelity and geographic borders play out through artwork and psychosomatic practices cannot be mapped with absolute precision. It's enough to suggest that Dorothea's bodily practices and such Netherlandish cultures are in some ways isomorphic. This suggestion might be tested comparatively for the heady complex of anxieties that issues in the breaking or ploughing of human bodies finds little purchase on English territory. Julian of Norwich, it's true, wishes to be taken to the point of death, but there's no sense of her being continuously at war with her own body. Marjorie Kemp at one point bites her own arm so deeply as to leave it permanently marked, but this is presented as part of one manic postpartum episode from which full recovery is made. Flagellants from Flanders, who come to London in 1349, found very little enthusiasm for processing around St Paul's Cathedral, or St Paul's, beating themselves with needle-like scourges. Chronicler, Wal Chronicler Walsingham, for one, was unimpressed by these Flemish flagellants. It was said, they, it was said that they were doing these things ill-advisedly, in that they did not have permission from the Apostolic See. And the next section is Changing Places, Uses and Fortunes of Dorothea. Dorothea of Montau was buried at Marion Verde three days after her death. Miracles and cures at the shrine were systematically accumulated, recorded and notarised. By 1396, John of Marion Verde had produced the first edition of his Latin Vita. This prologue urges the Roman papacy to deploy a canonised Dorothea against heresy, exhorting them to, number 15, add this morning star which appeared in faraway Prussia, the furthest hem of the as yet unsown garment of Christ, to the ecclesiastical starry firmament of saints, so that through its light the sad darkness of the schism may be lifted, the true Catholic faith dawn in the hearts of those now separated from the Mother Church. A more triumphalist term would speak of Dorothea as a saint at the very edge of Christendom, uniting with those who, like the Teutonic Order, shed blood to extend the seamless garment of the true Catholic faith. But Marian Verda writes in time of schism, division and doubt. The Pope of Rome finds a counterpart in Avignon, the Pope of France and Scotland. Hussites are reaching beyond Bohemia, meddling with the territorial disputes of Germans and Poles, and Conrad von Wannenroth, High Master of the Teutonic Order, are being condemned for Wycliffeite ideas. Enthusiasm for supporting further eastward expansion of the Teutonic Order is on the wane. Reconciliation of the Lithuanian Polish rulers led to the massive and irreversible defeat of the Teutonic Order at Grunwald in 1410. But chances for canonization in time of schism, and especially for a woman, were at any event very slender. After the canonization of St. Hedwig in 1267, only two, two women were canonized before 1460, Bridget of Sweden and Catherine of Siena. Jean Gerson, Chancellor of Paris, challenged Bridget's canonization while treating female mysticism generally with extreme skepticism. The affective extremes of Dorothea, coupled with the inexorable decline of the Teutonic Order, made Marianne Verda's Leben an untimely text. Its future will ride on the fortunes of place. Germanic devotion to Dorothea developed in two streams in the 15th century. The North chiefly accentuated her life, whereas the South, Bavaria and Austria, revered her as a female mystic. In 1486, urged by the High Master of the Teutonic Knights, Rome reopened Dorothea's canonization process. Despite the publication of Das Leben as Prussia's first book in 1492, little progress was made, and in 1525 the wheels came off as the last High Master of the Teutonic Order in Prussia actually became a Lutheran. <laughs> Amazing. There's still a branch in Amsterdam of the Teutonic Order. In 1544, just a little behind equivalent developments in England, Dorothea's shrine at Marienwerder was destroyed and a cult was suppressed. A century later, however, it was revived as part of a counter-reformation offensive with Poles, rather than Germans, leading the charge. Dorothy again marks a faith frontier where Teutonic Germans had once battled with Lithuanian pagans, German Lutherans now eyed Catholic Poles. 
The 19th century sees Dorothea folded into both large-scale histories of Prussia and more local journal publications. Little of this one might imagine made its way to England, yet one particularly, uh, one particularly talented translator of German seems to have brushed imaginatively with the mystic from Montau. The heroine of Middlemarch is one Dorothea Brooke. Dorothea, a young woman likely to seek martyrdom, has strange whims of fasting like a papist. She relishes the pleasure of renouncing pleasures. She suffers insomniac struggles and is cruelly treated. Her life story is framed by references to a saint who as a child seeks martyrdom in the country of the Moors. The saga ends with reference to crusaders of old. At the Vatican in Rome, when she has travelled on a fateful journey, it is remarked that she should be dressed as a nun. But she has married a disappointed, clerical, Latin-based scholar, a man whose systematising pedantry seeks to page her passionate and impulsive spirit. Eventually, she marries a fiery and romantic Pole called Ladislaw. Like Dorothy of Montel, this English Dorothea disappears into history while living out faithfully, as the very last sentence of the novel has it, a hidden life. Pressures for canonising Dorothy of Montel, building again through the later 19th century, intensify with developing political and territorial urgencies in the 1930s. Paul Niborowski's De Selige Dorothea von Preussen was published at Breslau in 1933. I've given you the title page. The title page faces a Dorothean built, depicting the, the saint at prayer. Her cloak is emblazoned with the cross, soon to be carried into Poland and points east of the Teutonic Order. You can just about make it out, the Teutonic cross on her, on her gown. Niborowski argues that his collection of documents pertaining to Dorothea's canonization process is extremely timely. This is number 15. For the times for Germany, for Christendom, for the entire civilization of Middle and Western Europe are more threatening today than ever before. Russian Bolshevism, having already spiritually poisoned the greater part of Germany and of other Christian countries, readies itself to bring and impose its ruinous doctrine upon us by force of arms. German Christianity needs a protectress, an intercessor, who can call God for help on their behalf. Niborowski perorates by pleading for non-Catholic German Christians to reconcile themselves with this medieval German saint. For she saw the repulse of Eastern unchristendom as chief purpose of the German Ostmark, her native ground. With him they should pray, Das es wie damals eins wieder von Deutschland heiße, ein Gott, ein Volk, ein Glaube. This prayer or call to arms echoes, of course, the Nazis, ein Reich, ein Volk, ein Führer. Niborowski's book, published Nihil Obstadt in September 1933, Caps off a year which sees Hitler become Chancellor, the Reichstag burned, Hitler assumed dictatorial powers, and 20,000 books burned in Berlin. The first shots of World War II were fired in Danzig. Two weeks later, Hitler was making a speech in that city. The great castle of Marienburg became a centre for Hitler youth rallies, broadcast all over Germany. Later it functioned as a prisoner of war camp. The Teutonic Order became the highest award bestowed by the Third Reich. One of its ten recipients was Reinhard Heydrich. It therefore seems extraordinary that Niborowski should get his own way, for on the 9th of January 1976, Dorothea was canonised by Pope Paul VI. Pressure for this canonization came chiefly from German Catholics displaced from Prussia in 1945, a process that saw Marian Werder become Quidzin and Danzig Gdańsk. Dorothea's canonization thus recompenses the final loss of border territory that her father helped Germanize and cultivate. On the 17th of July 1979, then Cardinal Josef Ratzinger, who in 1943 had been manning anti-aircraft guns to protect the BMW plant north of Munich, preached a sermon in Munich to celebrate Dorothea's elevation. Displaced Danziger Gunter Grass, however, was quicker off the mark. Dorothy of Montau appears in his novel Der Butt, or The Flounder, of 1977, as wife to the narrator, a.k.a. Albert Schlichting, swordmaker of Danzig. As such, she comes forth in a succession of female cooks 
spanning the whole history of this region, from primordial ooze to 70s feminist ferment. Petra Hörner, in her exhaustive, which is to say German doctoral, account of Dorothea's Nachleben, denounces the flounder as a distorted and falsified portrait. And this can hardly be denied, but does John of Marienwerder's Leben bring us any closer to flesh and blood Dorothea? Gunter Grass at least keeps us within John of Marienwerder's imaginative ambit, for his ideas of high Gothic Lenten cook Dorothea of Montau develop from this very text. Gunter Grass is coming out of the Marienwerder text. As a schoolboy, young Gunter Grass was instructed by one of Dorothea's great champions, Monsignor Richard Stachnik. Gunter Grass actually addresses a fictional letter to Stachnik in The Flounder within the novel. As my Latin teacher, the narrator says, you were a failure, but you inflected me, you infected me for good with a Dorothean poison. The letter proposes a scurrilous deal. If Stachnik renounces the canonization campaign, the narrator will stop calling Dorothea a witch. Bizarrely, the octogenarian Monsignor, outside the novel in real life, actually writes back, but only to vigorously denounce Gunter Grass's new novel. This strange dialogue of Latin-based scholarship with German fiction-making actually seems a fitting terminus to six centuries of intensive male-dominated struggle over Dorothea. Gunter Grass's particular genius lies in evoking urban and rural geographies and their changing with time, in particular Danzig and the rural hinterland that gave rise to Dorothea, here in dem nebligen Sumpfland zwischen den Flussen. His narrative faithfully adheres to the historically concrete style of the German Leben and obligingly fills in those details missed by das Leben. How, for example, did a Danzig sword maker find his way to Montau and how might he have courted young Dorothea? Knowing sword making to be a trade with the future, Gunter Grass's Albert Schlichtings, his number 17, went, often went to Montau on his way to Marienburg through the country between the Nogat and the Vistula, which had been freshly diked in after the famine years. Here, as often, Grass joins historical dots. A sword maker seeks out the Teutonic Knights in their greatest stronghold. Newly diked Montau lies by Marienburg. Albrecht discovers his future bride. Their early courtship, as Grass tells it, moves between farce, horror, and arresting detail. This is number, 19, uh, number 18. And when the child, grown to the age of 10 by that time, wheedled me into giving her a seven-chain scourge with a silver handle inlaid with mother of pearl and amber tears to play with, it had been ordered by the abbot of Marienwerder, my only feeling was of affectionate amusement. For how was I to guess that Dorothea drew blood night after night by flaying herself through her hair shirt? And the first verse is, Jesu, guide my little chain, for my flesh hath chosen pain, struck me as nothing more than fashionable babble. Only when at sixteen she was married to me, yet did not become my wife, did I, in temporary possession of her utterly indifferent flesh, feel the scars on her back and the festering still open wounds. Grass here vividly reminds us that self-punishment, the wounding of her own flesh, was Dorothea's most singular and consistent form of action. It's what she did and what she cared to do. For our nine little children, all but one of whom died young, Gunter Grass's sword maker says, she had hardly a glance. Dorothea is a strange poster girl for modern day Catholicism. But since Dorothea was canonized for her cult rather than her life, the meaning of a life was never up for serious examination in the 1970s. Third wave feminism might reclaim Dorothea, or more savvily, the pleasures of reading Dorothea for its quickly expanding canon. But for many readers, the castigated and self-wounded body of Dorothea will remain the most troubling and seemingly intractable aspect of a life and legend. With Susan Bordeaux, we might take the psychopathologies that develop within a culture far from being anomalies or aberrations, to be characteristic expressions of that culture, to be indeed the crystallization of much that is wrong with it. Uh, next section is Frontiers East and West. The psychopathologies, Susan Bordeaux's phrase, the psychopathologies that run through Das Leben der Seligen Frau Dorothee are, I believe, locational, testifying to irresolvable tensions and contradictions at a far border of Christendom. 
Gunter Grass, again, offers vital clues and points of departure, perhaps beginning with his own departure from the region in 1945, as Danzig becomes Gdańsk. For encountering Stachnik's canonising dreams, Gunter Grass does not straightforwardly set himself against belated and benighted Teutonic aspirations. He could not, in any event, do this straightforwardly, since he had worn the Teutonic cross himself, or rather, as we very recently discovered, the Siegruns of the SS. Thus, while seminarian Ratzinger was protecting BMW in Bavaria, schoolboy Grass was active further east. And as mythologized by the tin drum, Grass's own cultural and familial identity is split. A Kasubian mother, carrying forward the ancient and pagan traditions of a rural people that survives German and Polish invasion, an uncertain paternity shared between a German and a Pole. The mother, conceived on a bleak rural plain, eats herself to death after witnessing horror, a horse's head filled with blood-gorged eels. The meaning of this scene, the most memorable and famous from both the book and the film of the Tin Drum, is, so far as I can tell, indeterminate. Allegoresis is overwhelmed by sheer visual and descriptive revulsion. Artistic finessing is here enabled by the cultural assumption, most deeply rooted, as Susan Bordeaux again observes, that women are too much. The Tin Drum's true heroine dies because she eats too much. Dorothea whips her way towards oblivion, oblivion while eating too little. In either case, bloating or starving, the full force of cultural and familial tensions that prove irresolvable is borne by the female body. Pressures bearing down upon Dorothea of Montau, the first female recluse at the Prussian frontier, are, we've seen, many and complex. They include psychic unease at reclaiming or improving upon nature, carried eastward from the Low Countries, the crusading and commercial ambitions of the Teutonic Order, the career anxieties of one particular knight, a split between mind and geist and body that can uh, only end with the final destruction of the human frame. One further source of tension is experience at Marienburg, Montau and Marienwerder needs to be addressed. The sheer vastness of the Eurasian landmass the Teutonic Order presumes to conquer. Fear of this unknown territory is as old as Ovid, the folly of seriously setting out to conquer it as recent as Napoleon and Hitler. Pope Benedict XVI, early on in his career, wrote a book called Die Christliche Brüderlichkeit. Values of Christian and German brotherhood perhaps shaped his appreciation of Dorothea, the anchoress coached so painstakingly towards sainthood by the Teutonic Order. The celebratory sermon preached by the Cardinal on Dorothea's canonization was subsequently published in a volume called Christliche Glaube und Europa, Christian Belief and Europe. This begins by defining the foundational moment of Dorothea's life, the moment of conversion, as the tipping of scalding water upon her six-year-old body. It then reviews her life as wife and mother, as pilgrim and as anchoress. Ironically enough, Ratzinger's chief acknowledged source is Richard Stachnik, the sometime teacher of Gunter Grass. The then Cardinal Ratzinger sees Dorothea from the moment of her birth as a figure who, quoting from Ratzinger, belongs at once to East and West. Her father was a ditch digger from the Netherlands, a mother of North German extraction. But the world of the Middle Ages, the Cardinal continues expansively, the world of the Middle Ages knew nothing of modern day border divisions. Now this is a remarkable statement, particularly in light of more recent pronouncements by the future Pope on the drawing of borders. While prefect for the doctrine of the faith, the Cardinal took a strong stand against admitting Turkey to the EU on the grounds that Turkey had always been, quote, in permanent contrast to Europe. There's a long tradition, memorably exemplified by Jakob Burkhardt's landwork, landmark work on Renaissance civilization, of characterizing barbarities endemic to Western societies as Islamic, Islamic imports. Ratzinger concedes that the Ottoman Empire once stretched almost to Vienna, but argues that it was never European because it was always invasive. Quite what he thought the Teutonic Knights were up to in Palestine and Prussia remains unclear. Ratzinger's notion of an authentically European inside and outside is well served by imagining Dorothea as a Christian patroness keeping barbarism at bay. 
But the psychopathology is incubated in her cell and in her cult suggests rather a Europe wrestling with itself, with its own distinctive forms of violence and alienation at its eastern frontier. And then finally, the last short section, what Dorothea wants. I could hardly end the talk without it, or at least trying it, right? It remains to address finally and very briefly the question posed by Gunther Grass, was Dorothea wollte? It might be thought that what Dorothea craves is oblivion. She several times wishes herself dead, and her Leben ultimately envisages her frail body being utterly crushed by the Godhead. Her most joyful moments come as she assumes the life of a beggar. In Rome, she begs for alms. In Finsterwald, she practices the beggar's call, bread for the sake of our Lord. It delights her to remain there in misery, far from her worldly friends. Can it be, then, that Dorothea yearns for bloß Leben, mere life, freed from every symbolic determination, freed from the mighty superstructure that John of Marienwerder builds around her? I would argue not, pointing again to the places that Dorothea chooses to inhabit. Not just the physical spaces of a tireless journeying, but also those of her flights into beggary. In Rome, she determines to beg on the steps of St. Peter's. In Gdańsk, she begs at the main portal of the great parish church of Our Lady. These are two of the most powerful symbolically supercharged limines of Dorothean Christendom. The anchor hold of Marienwerder, located between life and death, seems their only worthy successor. The genuine beggars of Gdańsk were happy to see Dorothea walled away because her faux beggary, they said, cut into their own business. You know, we're real beggars here, you know, we need to be making a living and you're a faux beggar dressing up as one, right? Dorothea loves acting the beggar. She dresses up or down in a threadbare coat with a cheap piece of cloth for her head by way of disguise. She is, however, recognised and so her story can be told. She's so keen to be walled into her cell at Marienwerder that she helps the masons lay the bricks. Such individuating, self-dramatising flashes at key locales might reflect inspired authorship, but the decision to move into such liminal places does seem genuinely her own. Perhaps then this is the closest that we can come to the mystery of the mystic Dorothea. She is bent on Vernichtung, nothingness, but only as publicly staged as the most highly charged of liminal places. Her written life and cult are the project of an ambitious cleric, servant of that Teutonic order which translated her family to Europe's eastern frontier. The violences that roil through her text, in which the reader is flagellated as often as the woman herself, bespeak irresolvable tensions at that eastern frontier, a borderline sanctity. Any impulse to pathologise Dorothea of Montau May, that, may thus be as problematic as the will to canonise her, for anxieties about where exactly the true eastern limit of Europeandom may be marked, which is of course an anxiety internal to Europe itself, continue to play out through the 1930s to the 1970s to the present day to the unforeseeable future. Thank you very much.